Welcome. Hi, Matteo. How are you? I'm fine. How are you in New York? I'm uh, totally okay. Working away in my home studio. Uh, things are good. Okay, wonderful. So let's make a formal introduction for the audience uh, that is following us today. So my name is Matteo Kries, director of the Vitro Design Museum. And today as a part of our Instagram live talk series um, on the Vitro Design Museum account, I have the pleasure to have as a guest, Stefan Sagmeister, graphic designer, visual storyteller, typographer, um, based in New York and probably known to many of our followers through different projects that you have uh, launched uh, over the past years. And I'm looking forward to speaking to you, Stefan. Same here, same here. Let me, I think I can probably, yeah. I think there's a little bit of light, there's a little bit of improvement. Okay, yeah. Um, so uh, first things first, Stefan. Um, uh, what about the situation in New York? So you're um, living there. How are you experiencing the lockdown? professionally, but also how are you experiencing the city? Well, I'd say there is, uh, you know, New York, I guess, or I know was always not really a fair city. I mean, there was always a big discrepancy between the rich and the poor. Uh, and I think that discrepancy now has been widened mm -hmm. uh, or definitely become even more extreme, you know, uh, I'm sitting here in my lovely studio overlooking the city and uh, working away. But I, if I go out, uh, there is an emergency room right on our block while on 13th Street, I'm on 14th Street. And there are these infamous white uh, refrigeration trucks standing in front of it as a true reminder of and the division between those who are healthy, like myself and pretty much all of my friends, thank, uh, thankfully enough, who, whose life has changed minimally or in many times actually has improved. I've heard many comments from people who say actually, uh, I'm extremely enjoying this. Uh, and those who are sick or the people who have to take care of those who are sick, of course, is gigantic. But I guess that that would be, that's not a real New York centric thing. I mean, that's probably the situation in many, many places around the world, or definitely in the places who have been as hard hit as New York has been. Mm. And are you involved in many uh, talks like this? Do you experience that, you know, certain uh, discussions, debates are going on on, a, on the digital area um, more intensely than, than before? Is that something, an experience to share? I have you to admit that I definitely have a form letter that basically declines uh, automatically to take place or to, to basically to be part of many, many more of those things. I tried to, uh, to limit it to maybe two or three a week because uh, otherwise it just stops making sense. Yeah, I understand. Well, you launched a project, um, Stefan, a while ago, already before Corona, uh, which is called Design Review, where you use your Instagram account to invite people uh, from all over the world, designers, creatives, to share projects. And then you're giving them very short, but uh, as I often see, very sharp criticism. I, I think it's always really to the point. And I guess in the times of the lockdown, this has um, gotten a completely different signification for many people, no? because it's now many, for probably many people, the only way or one only way to, to get an exchange, right? Uh, to get visibility. Well, it definitely, uh, I would say that I get many, many more projects now. Uh, 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 than I used to. And I even see that with, you know, the, like the numbers of people following or so, I mean, all that is definitely uh, doubled and tripled. Uh, so very clearly, I mean, you're right. There is, it seems to be uh, a bigger need. I mean, the, the entire thing really came out of a salon that Louis Bourgeois used to do. And many years ago, 10 years ago, I signed myself up and went to Louise's house and she really 
took our work apart. And this, of course, was done in person. I think there was a maximum of 10 people who were allowed to come on a Sunday night. And I used to copy that straight. Basically, every Monday night, I had designers come, uh, uh, come in and I would critique their work. And when then... That? When was that? That was basically the last six or seven years okay. I did that. And then my travel schedule became so dense that it didn't really, that in-person Monday night review didn't really work anymore. So I uh, transformed it into, uh, uh, into a, uh, uh, an Instagram account. Then, of course, it, uh, with the advantage that it could now reach many, many, many poor people rather than just the 10. And, of course, the disadvantage that you can't be quite as in person, as tough as you can in a very small close room. But I, uh, I still feel it, uh, it worked fine. I've heard feedback from uh, a number of design faculty who says they follow it to see how they could, uh, like how somebody else reviews people's work. Uh, and of course, as you pointed out, uh, Instagram ultimately is, an, is a visual uh, uh, medium. So I try to be very short and precise uh, okay. because meaning I myself don't really want to read, uh, you know, long litanies on, mm. you know, of text. I think, yes, I think also the shortness of the text, you know, can have a quality. Of course, it's nice to have a pretty pages, which is really uh, long and can, you know, go back and forth. But I think this really a sense of um, preciseness that you try to have in these critiques is, is I think, quite appropriate for the medium. Um, and I also think that ultimately it's very, like, the ability to wiggle a larger argument down into something that is short and to the point is of course very much a graphic design notion. You know, mm -hmm. meaning ultimately you could possibly even define the profession of graphic design as that ability to look at a fairly large group of data or information and being able to communicate that in the shortest possible way. So I think that from, a, it's ultimately for myself, it's also a graphic design exercise to figure out what can I tell that person in a sentence or maximum two that hopefully could be helpful. Or sometimes when, the, when I feel that the work is not really good, I might use it to maybe make a larger point if that's possible. Yeah, that's an interesting point because you, you point towards the fact that you're not only designing visually, but you're also designing the communication and the interaction oh, and the, oh, totally. the, yeah. Yeah. The, the format that you yeah. offer in this platform is part of your design in that case. Um, and, it, you know, that reminds me a lot of your approaches in, in those two exhibitions that you did over the past years, right, where you also on the one hand, of course, you design, you design visuals, but basically what you design is a communication, a psychological impulse that people should take away, and then you act as a kind of, uh, you know, uh, um, indicator of directions where people could think, right? To try to open new thoughts. So that's, a, to me, a very typical aspect of your work. I mean, there's a, there's a very direct line between the Instagram reviews and let's say the exhibition on beauty, uh, a very, an extremely direct line is that of course, we tried to keep the wall text as short as possible. And I worked many, many hours. I mean, many, many, many hours to cut a text down and down and down. Of course, also losing details that comes with it, but, uh, for the same reasons, because I know in the same way that I don't want to read lengthy texts on Instagram, I feel the same way in museums. Like, you know, basically you want to give that information, but you want to give it, you want to leave people also 
space and time to be able to look at work and to, uh, to experience that. And so uh, we worked really hard to make that precise. And of course you lose, you, I meaning there's compromises as, you know, in any design mm -hmm. uh, project. Uh, the, and of course the idea, I think the two are a little bit different. I felt that the, 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 the show on happiness was very personal and very much centered on my own happiness, mostly because I am not a happiness expert. I haven't studied psychology. So I felt that at least if I talk about my own happiness, it's, you know, I am an expert on my own, so I have more to say and uh, don't have to, uh, you know, make any larger statements. In beauty, it's somewhat different because Jessica and I have been in this profession for a while and uh, possibly there we could say we are some sort of experts. And uh, at the same time, also the beauty exhibition is very much a fighting exhibition. It has a very clear stance. It, it, it acknowledges that stance in the extreme beginning, meaning in the text when you come in. And it's very much a sort of like a gung-ho hooray for the importance of beauty. Very much, I meaning it's almost like an activist kind of exhibition. And I'm normally not a big friend of that kind of direction, meaning I hate watching activists, uh, like documentary films made by activists because they are so colored. Uh, in our case, we, we acknowledge that very much from the beginning. We have a point of view and we wanna basically bring you over. We wanna, you know, we wanna be evangelists for that sort of point of view. And then of course you can reject that or not. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I mean, for me as a as a museum person, those exhibitions were extremely interesting because you found a format which is, you know, between these typically curated exhibitions seen from a from an academic point of view, mm -hmm. you could also do an exhibition on beauty or happiness from that standpoint wouldn't probably be so interesting as as the those two, but it's also not the single artist's point of view, right? You, you, tried, you, you found a stance which is between the two worlds, which to me makes it, you, you combine uh, the, the exhibition design with the creation of the messages, and that makes it very powerful. Probably you don't lose the energy that sometimes gets lost between the curator who has his ideas and the exhibition design, and you could just channel it all. I mean, basically because we did both that obviously came sort of like in both directions were, uh, were considered and meaning ultimately then back again, you kind of, I think automatically design the kind of exhibition that you would want to see yourself, you know, that you feel uh, comfortable or that you think is entertaining and informative, uh, informative to, for, for, for yourself and uh, what we for sure tried to do, and I think that I can say we did that successfully, we definitely wanted to make an exhibition, exhibitions for the gen for a general public. Mm -hmm. Like I feel and I feel so many exhibitions, even though they take place in a public museum, are ultimately designed for, spe for specialist audiences. And those exhibitions, of course, have a right to be, but I enjoy them more when they are presented in a space that is made for that specialist audience. Yeah. If it's like, you know, I, I see so many very specific, very small audience exhibitions made in spaces like MoMA or like where you know that the majority of the audience has absolutely no possibility to understand what's being presented here. Uh, so be definitely, and I always thought that, you know, whatever, that whole thing, oh, he's a musician's musician or he's a designer's designer. I always hated that. Like, Design exhibitions for designers, I couldn't think of something more boring and self-indulgent. 
Yeah. So be I, careful try to avoid that. I totally agree. I mean, it's, it's, it would be against the, the idea of design to yeah. do something for the niche. So I couldn't agree more. Uh, let's, let's stay for a second with those two topics, happiness and beauty. I think both in these times have uh, even gotten other twists, uh, other significations. Yeah. Maybe first start with the later one, the, the beauty topic. You know, we're living in very serious times, um, even before the corona crisis. Topics in the design debate are as well, social design, social responsibility, climate change, diversity, you yeah. name it. So beauty sometimes even seems a little dated, right, as a concept. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm provoking you. So, sure. but it's, you know, somehow, isn't this a very individualistic concept that is not really contributing to solve those pressing issues. Mm -hmm. um, and how does it relate to those pressing issues? What, I, I'm sure you have thought about that. So what's your take? Well, oh, there's much to talk about that. I mean, for one thing, we believe, but also can show that beauty is not as, in, as individualistic as many people believe it to be. Like, you know, that sentence, uh, beauty lies in the eye of the beholder is probably the single worst thing that ever happened to beauty because if it would be true then there would have then there would be it would make absolutely no sense for anybody to pursue it or for a designer to work hard to achieve it because if everybody thinks something different about it then why even why even try to achieve it mm -hmm. now we know and most scientists think that actually roughly half of what we think of as beautiful is actually shared throughout cultures worldwide throughout time. And it's basically something that's inherent with us and we agree upon. And we've done many tests and uh, there is research that we did that's being, that's, uh, that's, uh, uh, being duplicated by other research that basically shows that many things uh, we agree upon and you know easy easy examples would be blue is the favorite color around the world in any culture there is no culture in the world where not a majority doesn't think that blue is their favorite color it comes very much likely from our prehistoric ancestors that you know just uh felt that when the sky was blue it was a safe sky and when the sea was blue it was a safe sea but it goes on uh there is authoritative research on it that roughly, sort of like by rule of thumb is roughly half is individualistic. And that of course depends on how much have we seen, in what context do we see it, how do we feel when we see it. And then the other half is really in common. And of course, because that's still a very wide, that's a, that's a very big part that we can actually do something about. And I know that specifically among mediocre architects, the idea that beauty is even considered is sort of being rejected. I think that they have still these, you know, conservative notions of modernism where modernism rightfully so in the very, very beginning of the 20th century after World War I sort of like rejected the, central, the, the, the centrality of beauty as sort of a 19th century notion. In the meantime, basically all people within our field that are any, that show any kinds of intelligence have realized that this has nothing to do with the time, but it was a very temporary kind of idea. Many architects, I mean, you know, I've recently heard an interview actually on Swiss TV with uh, Jacques Herzog where he talked about beauty. But, you know, and, uh, you know, Renzo Piano, like many, many good people are very much, uh, very much understand that, uh, that uh, you can also, instead of calling it beauty, you could also call it deliberate form, like the creation of deliberate form is very much at the center not only of what we do, but also has a real impact on how an audience feels and not only how it feels, but how it behaves. And there's now 
many, many, many examples around on that. A favorite of mine is if you compare the two train stations in Manhattan. One is Grand Central, where we grand, as the name says, uh, 19th century, or it's from the 20th century, but from a stylistic point of view, a 19th century uh, station. And then there is Penn Station, a, uh, a station that's been built in the 70s, not very good. And you can actually measure this scientifically because uh, uh, the New England Complex Systems Institute went through the trouble of measuring this with tweets. They can basically, you can look at all of Manhattan. Uh, they have a little algorithm that shows uh, which tweets come from which location and they can measure if, the, if there are more negative and positive tweets coming out of it. And you can see that uh, on that map, Grand Central is always green, meaning there's more positive tweets coming out of it, negative. Penn Station is always red. There's more negative tweets coming out of it. Mm -hmm. uh, so we, we feel differently, but there's also many, many different mm -hmm. examples. If we go from, I don't know, New York's High Line, you know, done by uh, De Los Cofidio with a lot of attention, love and care on the form that that renovation of that old train track took. <clears throat> or let's say, if we go to the El Philharmonie, uh, you know, the Herzog and Timmero building in Hamburg, if you, and I've been there, you can feel the the audience being uplifted just when they go into it. Mm -hmm. you, you can feel it there. And that's, that's not a scientific study, but I'm sure you could actually prove that scientifically, uh, that this, how the space uh, changes the well-being of the people. Mm -hmm. the, uh, another, if we go for another Swiss example, the, uh, the Terme in Wals by Peter Zumthor would be another one. You know, meaning I've been there many times. There is a feelable difference between the Terme of Zumthor, of how people feel and behave, how slowly everybody walks in there, than a regular Thermalbad anywhere else in Switzerland. Oh, I totally agree. And, but you're speaking now about beauty and architecture a lot, about uh, examples of really some of the greatest contemporary buildings. Um, on the other hand, if I go back to my initial question, you know, the topics that design has to cope with today, which are probably not directly related to beauty, sometimes they are really tough and, and ugly and, and complex. Mm -hmm. Beauty can also be complex, certainly, but how can we use beauty as a, as a tool or as a trigger to deal with these issues, which we cannot deny, you know, which are there and cope with them. Well, from a very personal point of view, I think that everybody who just spent the last eight weeks or so locked into their apartment probably can talk about how, what they did in their apartment what stuff they hung, what, how, they, uh, how they chose the furniture, what an impact that had on their well-being in the last eight weeks. And uh, my extremely strong assumption would be that the, the, the people who took that apartment seriously, who spent some love and care into the design of that apartment, came out of that time better than the people who didn't care. Mm. I think that that would make a huge difference there. And, uh, if, and I think that that basically would definitely be tra translated extremely. And there, of course, we can uh, uh, again fall back onto scientific studies if we talk about beauty within, uh, within hospitals. You know, meaning there is proper studies out there that show that you know, simple things like if you have a window that allows you to have some sort of connection with nature again, the healing, the healing process can be shortened. Uh, there is, you know, uh, a, a guy called Michael Murphy who built many uh, 
many hospitals in, uh, in developing countries who puts a very big uh, onus on that. And in this case, not just the way how these hospitals are being, uh, the form of the hospital itself, but also how is that hospital being built? Like, is, how is that beauty achieved? Uh, who, is, who is part of that building process and so on? So I think that there is a extremely opposite of what one might expect, that beauty is somehow frivolous or just something that's, you know, for the beauty industry or it's basically just something that's used for in commercials or so. I think it's a, an extremely important part of what it means to be human. Mm. It's really within us. I think that also makes the relation to happiness, right? Uh, to to yeah. other psychological factors that can be influenced by beauty. And I think it's also important that you make this point in favor of beauty in order to defend this concept against the trivialization that we see of beauty ideals on social media, where we see that you know beauty is constantly under threat. And of course, there's all yes. fight about what actually is beautiful and how superficial is it, how complex and how real can it be? So I think it's important that there is this discussion about even such idealistic concepts of beauty to prove that they are not so remote as they may seem. They are really connected yeah. to, to the present. Stefan, I would like to do a little journey into time back into your career. Um, sure. Uh, you know, I've been browsing a lot through your work in the last days to prepare this talk. And um, you, you went to uh, New York to Pratt uh, School. Um, then you spent some time in Hong Kong, then coming back to New York in the early 90s to open your own studio first. And then you found Darkmeister Walsh in 2012. And even before I read further uh, into your biography, looking at your work, I thought there must be be a relation to Tibor Kalman, you know, to this person that was so important in the graphic design evolution of the 1980s and 90s of this punchy visual language. And also the, the reading of, or the combination of text and image, the, the reading of image as text and vice versa. And then I found beautiful interviews where you say how important this relation was. Can you say something about Tibor's influence on your work? Absolutely. It's a great question. I love to talk about Tibor. So when I was a student uh, at Pratt, uh, there was a company in New York uh, called Emmon Company, which was Tibor's company, which I as a student really felt was doing the best work. Like it's uh, not all, but many of the things that came out of Emmon Company were just exactly my cup of tea. I, I felt they were brilliant. And I, I, uh, when I wrote my thesis at Pratt, I definitely wanted to interview Tibor, but you know, he was the, the hottest designer in New York. And I, I think I called 50 times. I, I basically, I just called every day. I tried to be friendly to the receptionist and not go on her nerves, but I just called every day. And I think after yeah, at one time, this was still the era of answering machines. So I got, an, uh, I got a, a, a call back and then I did get through and uh, I did, was able to do that interview. And uh, I sent him the thesis afterwards when it was done. And he very, very much liked the thesis. And then we were in constant contact. And uh, ultimately, I started to work there after my time in Hong Kong and worked there for a very short time, for six months. But uh, in those six months, Tiba was able to give excellent advice. Like they, they were known among people who worked there as Tiborisms because he had that knack to, uh, to put something complex into some snap into one single snappy sentence. He was really the master of that. And I remember when I opened the studio, one of those, one of the 
I asked for his advice, what I should look out for. And his answer was, well, the only difficult thing when running a design studio is to figure out how not to grow. Everything else is super easy. Mm -hmm. And I definitely took that advice uh, seriously. But I think that, that that was the magic of his advice because many people give advice and it basically rolls off you. You hear it and it goes out there and it doesn't really have any impact on your life. Somehow, Tiba was able to give advice in a, in, the, in a kind of way that you could take it in and really implement it into real life. I mean, I remember it was a time when Tibo designed a Keith Herring exhibit. He did the exhibition design at the Whitney Museum. And Keith had already died. So Tibo was sort of the star at the exhibition opening. Like, and there was a long line of people uh, waiting to talk to him. And I stood next to him. I must have been at the time when I was working at Emma Company. And he had something smart to say to every single person who wanted to talk to him. It was, it was amazing. I mean, you literally wanted to have a, a, a video camera there uh, because I think so many of those things that he had to say would have been quite helpful to many, many, many people. Now, he, he definitely was one of the smartest, most intelligent people I've ever met and funny, and luckily his widow, Myra Kalman, is definitely just on his level, uh, and she is alive, and she is still very much a good friend, so I'm meeting up with her here and there, and uh, maybe also get a dose of Tibor through her. Mm. Wonderful story, Stefan. Um, for those of you who, have, who don't know um, who Chibo Kalman is, I, probably uh, you, most of you know it, a graphic designer who was working in New York in the 1980s and 90s, got very famous through the magazine Colors that he designed for the Benetton Company, which really launched a completely new visual language, right? Which then, yeah. to me, went right into the visual language of the internet about communicating through the image, associating images. So somehow he anticipated the internet uh, in, in print. Uh, and um, and I, I, mean, I think it, the relation is, I mean, you, you took this influence clearly further. It's not, no, it's not like Tibor's, but you see that influence, which is super interesting. And um, another influence, which I always see in your work, which is quite obvious, is, is the influence of the music industry. If I look at you know your interest in the human body, in the tattooed body, in the disguised body, sexuality, you know, this, these languages is something you use, uh, which are languages that are vocabularies that come from the world of music. So let's talk about that sphere of your work uh, a little bit. Um, probably that is what what you what started your career working with many different music groups like. Rolling Stones, Lou Reed, many other really great musicians. Um, just a personal question by curiosity, you know, it's a little gossip. Who was the most difficult to work with? Can you well, the that? most difficult job that we've ever done in the music world, without any doubt, and it's, it was 10 times as, diff as, as difficult as anything else, was Aerosmith. Uh, and it was just a complete nightmare of a job where the band was, had just signed with a new record label and the record label had paid an, incredible, an unheard amount of money for the band and the band was you know, already well established but also quite older and many other record labels had sort of laughed about that so the new record label was under pressure to really, that's this new uh, that this album would sell. And when the band came back from the, uh, uh, from this, uh, from the studio, the, uh, the label rejected uh, the music, which then created all sorts of problems. The drummer left, the 
the manager of many, many years who had originally discovered them was fired and everything became this chaos situation. And we found ourselves, and I wasn't that experienced yet in very big time music productions. So I wasn't quite aware that we became this little ball that was thrown around between management, band, and record label. And it was this never ending two year process that it's too, like, it had every, it had every problem that you could possibly imagine, including bomb threats. So it was just, uh, yeah, it, uh, I hope that it remains the worst project of my life. It would be good, interesting to go more into detail about that, but let's not do that um, about the bomb threats. But um, Stefan, I mean, working with the music industry probably has changed a lot over the past 20 or 30 years with you know, digital streaming becoming more important. Um, so designing a record cover changed when you designed uh, CDs and uh, CDs, albums. Uh, changed when music streaming became um, the, the normal way to distribute music. How has the, the role of the album and your work as a designer on communicating that music changed with that digitalization of music industry? I mean, completely, 100%. And of course, we basically concentrated on music really in the first part or the first phase of the studio. Like, uh, uh, you might know that, you know, every seven years I took a sabbatical, a full year sabbatical. And so from my now point of view, looking back, I sort of see the studio in four phases, divided by the sabbaticals, because the studio always changed after the sabbatical. And so it was really phase one that was very music oriented. Uh, and meaning by now it's completely changed, meaning the, obviously, you have a choice. Most people listen to music with a tiny little digital file that sort of like tries to represent the cover but doesn't really. Uh, there is a little niche market going on that's gorgeous. That's the vinyl cover that in urban centers has quite some resurrection. I mean, if, if you go to Rough Trade in Brooklyn, it's a giant vinyl store. It's the same size than, you know, the Tower Records and HMV stores used to be. Uh, all the people that you see in there, I'm always the only guy, the, the, the only old guy in there. So all the people that buy the vinyl in Brooklyn are of an age that they didn't even, they didn't participate when vinyl was around the first time around. And it's much more of a, I think that many people wind up leaving the vinyl in the shrink wrap and just take the, the, the download code out and listen to it uh, digitally. It's, and in that small niche market, the quality of the packaging is fantastic, possibly better than it ever was. I mean, if you look at the last two, three years, of what's been coming out on vinyl and the packaging it came in, it might be the golden age of vinyl packaging, strangely, from 2008 until two, uh, from 2018 until 20 or so. Uh, the, uh, and we show many of those actually in the beauty show because of course they are close to my heart. I myself or our studio hasn't really participating in that. We here and there did a music job, mostly for clients we already had, like we did, you know, in the middle, a David Brew and Brian Eno album, or we did one for Skeleton Key later on. But ultimately, it's, you know, this is a niche market. Mm -hmm. And I have to say, I myself, as we talked about before, was always interested in a large in a large audience. So part of the reason why I felt, I mean, there were many reasons why I was drawn to the music world or doing design for the music industry. But one of them was that, you know, when we did an album for Jay-Z, the, the first print run was 5 million. Mm -hmm. And the packaging was never being thrown away. So it was very much, 
this idea that you could live in really a mass household sort of environment was just very appealing. The design of a piece of vinyl that is printed a thousand or two thousand times is less appealing to me. But I also feel there is a, it's a bit of a young person, it's a young designer's world. And so I think I leave that to the 25 year olds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But still, I think the influence from that world in your early career was, was I think, another significant oh. factor. And, uh, you know, going back to that made me think about an exhibition that we did in our museum a few years ago called Night Fever, about the design history of nightclubs, mm -hmm. where we made clear that, you know, nightclubs have always been a kind of Gesamtkunstwerk yeah. of um, Uh, graphic designers participating, facial designers, the music, the fashion. I mean, this all makes this holistic uh, work of, of art that is a night in the club. And okay. um, so, I mean, you went to New York in the late 1980s, probably, or early 90s. Yeah. Uh, of course, you know, there were clubs in that exhibition that you might have known, like the Palladium or... Sure. Even still, Studio 54, you were mentioning Keith uh, Haring, worked uh, in Palais. Uh, uh, have you experienced those, uh, sure. those clubs and were they yeah. influential? I would say this. Uh, I was never a real a club kid. Uh, mostly, I think, because I was never very successful as far as women was concerned. In, uh, I could never pick up a woman in a club. It's like, uh, the music was too loud, you couldn't really talk, it was just not my thing. But having said that, I actually, of course, I mean, I came here, I studied at Pratt from 86 to 88. So of course, all the studios, uh, Studio 54 was gone, but, but I think it was gone, it definitely was not on my radar. But of course, Palladium, the tunnel area, uh, all those of limelight, all those were clubs, of course, that we did go to and we did enjoy. And you could definitely, I mean, you know, talk about designing an experience, you know, like yeah. for a while in the beginning of the, of the dot com boom everybody who designed the website thought that they were designing an experience, even though it was some crap website. But I would say if you went to a nightclub in the 80s in New York, or still, if you go, if you go to a large concert uh, that is designed, you know, these are real designed experiences, and you actually have an experience, meaning that many, many people Uh, when they come back from whatever, Madison Square Garden or, uh, or a stadium or uh, to see a real design show or a smaller one for 500 or 1,000 people, I think that very small shows normally aren't really designed. If you go and see a guy with a guitar in a club uh, or in a bar, that's probably, there's not a lot of design there, but, uh, uh, or custom design for that person. But for shows 500 and up, uh, some of them are unbelievably designed and are a big factor in the kind of experience that you have there. And I think that's where they meet with your interest, like you showed in the beauty and happiness exhibition. No? That how Absolutely. can you create um, a multi-layered, multidisciplinary um, experience where different design expressions are collaborating, intertwined, and, and then you know, bringing you to a point of experience that you have not reached before. So I think this, um, this is very typical for your work where you, you try to uh, you know, bring the limits, push the boundaries of a discipline. And, and that brings me to the next field of your work, which is typography and book design. Um, and very often we see in your works that an image becomes typography, Typography is read as an image, uh, and, and the books are always objects, which I love. You know? In our museum, <clears throat> with a much more limited 
possibility, we also try to make exhibition catalogs that are not just, you know, standard 250 page books, but really something you want. I think it doesn't make sense anymore to make a book that you may buy and then after 10 years you put it away. I think you know, in an age where the book has become so under threat, we should make books that give us arguments to, to keep the medium uh, of the book. Um, ha has your way of making books changed over the last 10 or 20 years with a growing importance of social media and digital design? How are you looking at this field today? I mean, I think that even 10 years ago or so, the book as an object was already a well uh, visited trope. I mean, that uh, most of us even then felt, or many of us then felt that uh, reading a book has gives different opportunities to you as a designer, but also to you as a reader. And there sh you should take advantage of all of the advantages that that medium has. Obvious ones being haptic, being able to turn the page. What does that mean? How do you reveal the next thing? Like, can you surprise by that turning page? Things that you can't do online or things that film or video doesn't really allow you to do. I mean, you know, one fantastic, beautiful <laughs> advantage of uh, uh, of the book by itself is that it allows for for a reader to quickly get an impression in a bookstore by just leaving it through for 10 seconds. And there's a completely different experience for the person who might see that book at a friend's place and spends five minutes with it. And there's a total different experience for the owner of that book who might spend many, many hours with it. And of course, so we try, <laughs> as a rule, we try to design books that, that address those different, uh, those different readers. So that somebody in 10 seconds, somebody in 10 minutes, somebody in 10 hours can get something out of it. And that it's appealing for all those different situations. That's uh, just one of the many things that are very special, I think, for, for a book. And of course, we tried to, uh, as good as we could, sometimes more successful than other times, to take advantage of that situation. What I find also interesting about you making books as objects is that you know, the role of typography is always uh, reflected. You know? It's not just using it, but what I am taking away when I look at your books is that you're really addressing the, the relevance of typography. And to me, you know, typography is probably in design is one of the, or well, maybe the element which is perceived as one of the most special things. But if we think about it, it's the most common uh, design tool that is used and that's design. So I'm always thinking about how can this gap be, be bridged, you know, how can, and can the the perception of typography or the, the usage of typography be brought out of the niche and how can we realize also to a, to a broader public how important it is. And if I say typography, I, I also mean, you know, emojis and, and visual uh, icons, which, uh, which are not the usual letters. And I think you're, you're always taking it to that point. I mean, I think that we also tried to make the kind of typography that makes it clear to a reader that this has been designed by a human being. You know, so much type hides their humanness. You know, because there's so much typography out there, not just by the letter form itself, but also how it's used that basically pretends that the whole thing has come out of a machine. And I think these are sort of like some of the more sorry remnants of early modernism, where of course in 1910, it was the machine age and everybody was like, you know, let's bring the machines in, let's get rid of that dusty old ornamentic crap from the 19th century. But we've now had 110 years of that sort of thing. 
And I find it much more interesting now to basically communicate with an audience from a human to a human. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so much graphic design, if you would take it out on the street and ask people randomly, who has designed this? A lay person might think, oh, this has been designed by a computer. Not really knowing that there might have been 15 people behind that in meetings discussing all that because still with the, 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 the end result has been carefully constructed to look like it's been made by a machine. So we try to sometimes obviously by just using hands typography, but hopefully more often a little bit more sophisticated where it's still clear that human beings made this for other human beings. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think one feels that in that in the use of typography. And what I like about it is that, you know, it's, it works. Uh, I mean, it, you know, it's not um, a purpose per se, it doesn't get dysfunctional, but you, you deliberately calculate the, the glitches and the way it it, it works with our perception. So I think, again, we're, we're back at your interest in working with perception and with humans, no? with how we, we work, how we interact with what you design. Um, I mean, I would say that every designer, I think, thinks about how their work is perceived and how to improve that perception or how to basically make that, that piece of communication work faster, clearer, or extremely important to me, more joyful. Uh, that's, uh, you know, obviously what we do has to work. Uh, if it doesn't work, it's not design. I think it's definitely one of the central definitions of design is that there has to be a function with it. But that function by itself can never, ever, ever be enough. Because if all we do is to create things that work, then we are just, stu then we are just engineers, which is a fine profession, but it's not one that I chose. Meaning, you know, engineering is amazing and fantastic, but it's very distinct from being a designer. And I feel that in many ways, what differentiates us from the engineering world is, the, is that we are able to actually delight somebody. That it doesn't just work and is in the background, but it's also that it can be delightful. And I think that's a, a, that element of delight has been neglected, not just in graphic design, like, you know, in all of those, you know, millions and millions of corporate brochures set in, you know, sans serif type on a white background and a bleeding image next to it. Yes, it probably informs, but there is just zero delight in all of this. And I think that zero delight is hampering and reducing its functionality incredibly. So delight works. People like to look at things that delights them. Well, your work is the proof of this, Stefan. <laughs> <didn't Well>, <laughs> thank you, Matteo. We, to finish, should we take in some questions? Do you want to do sure. that? Sure, yes. absolutely. We absolutely. had a very uh, and very numerous, and they, they followed us intensely. So let's see what, what the audience has to ask. Um, from, from all over the world, I saw people from Costa Rica and India and all over Europe. Um, so you can send us questions, guys. Would you call ugliness beautiful? That's a direct well, it's, I would say that <clears throat> ugliness for sure is not the opposite of it. Uh, I, uh, you know, I before okay. mentioned, you, I before mentioned, ugly, sorry. Yeah. Well, I before mentioned that deliberate form could also be uh, 
used for instead of beauty. But you could, of course, you can make, as a designer, you can make something deliberately ugly and that has been made, done many, many, many times. Uh, I would say that, I don't know, right now, probably the most famous ugly trend would be these giantly over-designed and overwrought sneakers that are very trendy for the last couple of years. Now, and I actually like the the purposefully ugly or the the on the to design something uh, specifically ugly. The the problem with most things that many of us perceive as ugly. Let's say the the vast stretches of. Uh, small malls interspersed with uh, discount furniture stores and gas stations and fast food outlets. Many of us think of those, of those neighborhoods as being ugly and we know because nobody goes there and have to have their holiday there. People don't perceive these neighborhoods as beautiful. And I think that the these places are not ugly because somebody wanted them to be ugly. They are ugly because somebody didn't give a shit. And I think that, that not giving a shitness is really responsible for 98% of everything that's ugly in this world. Mm -hmm. It's those neighborhoods, but it's also a badly designed tool that nobody really thought about the form or uh, uh, it's, that's not caring, I think, is behind uh, the vast majority of things that many of us perceive as being ugly. Mm. Stefan, we're being flooded with questions. <laughs> I'm trying to, pick them. to stay, uh, uh, to, to follow them. Um, uh, one question came, uh, what is your advice uh, to stay creative in these times of the lockdown? Uh, I think that's an easy question. Uh, one I can answer with for myself, dressing properly, making a, uh, making a distinction between the time that's used working and the time that's used hanging out. So I, as you can see, I dressed properly today in the morning. I got up very early. Uh, I was on my desk uh, after exercising and all that, I was on my desk at eight and I'm dressed properly. And by the time, if I switch off today around six or seven, I'll actually redress for the evening. I want to really make that differentiation. And mm -hmm. then for in, within the lockout time, what works really well for me is a plan. Like if I just sit at the table without any idea what I'm going to do, um, chances are I'm going to wind up down some rabbit hole on the internet looking for something and feeling in the evening that I wasted my day. Mm -hmm. So I myself very much need a plan, which in my case, really, I, I write down what it is that I want to work on. I, have a rough, I start with what is it that I'm interested in? Mm -hmm. Like, and then I figure out what, what projects could come out of that interest. And in the beginning, I have quite some experience in that because I've already done three full year sabbaticals. And, you know, in the first sabbatical, in the beginning, I purposefully didn't want to make a plan because I wanted to go against the grain knowing that I am a planner. And it was awful a complete waste of time. I was busy, but I didn't get anything done. So uh, in my case, I make a plan. Uh, once I have a list of things that I want to work on, I put them in a, uh, in, a, uh, in a hierarchy, meaning I weight them on how important they are for me. And then I put a little weekly plan together, very much like in kindergarten, like, you know, something that important gets five weekly five hours a week something that's less important gets half an hour a week and then i fill however many hours i want to work on in 
the, uh, during my sabbaticals, it was normally I put 40 planned in and then it became too much. Then I put 30 planned in. So I had to fine tune the system a little bit, but it definitely worked as in I had a good time during the sabbaticals and I got the stuff that I wanted to do and I did the things that I wanted to do. Yeah. And I think that's also a great answer to another question I, I read here, uh, which is what would you advise to a designer with a creative block? You know, probably the same. Uh, well, that would be a slightly different answer out uh, there. Uh, I think the easiest for me dealing with creative block is just switching projects. I always have also now at least five projects going on at the same time. So if I'm stuck on one, I just switch to the other. And then a method that I loved uh, and have been using many, many, many times is a method that was prescribed by a philosopher from Malta called Edward de Bono. And he basically says that uh, if you think about a project and it Let's say, I, let's say because I see this first, let's say we have to design a class. And the normal way for me to design this class would be I would look at the history of glasses. Uh, we did do that. There's actually a whole history of glasses in the beauty show. But let's say normally I would look at the history of glasses. I would uh, maybe interview restaurant owners or people who use glasses a lot, what they like in a glass, what they don't like in a glass. I might look at glass production facilities of how they produce that glass. And all of that would probably be helpful, but also would likely make me design a glass very much in line with all the glasses that already exist. And De Bono says, forget about the history of glasses, forget about the needs or anything, start with your start designing this glass by looking at something that has nothing to do with the glass. So let's say I look around my room here and what do I see? I see a wicker. I see a piece of wicker, like a wicker chair out the uh, out on my balcony. Okay, so let's look at this glass from the point of view of wicker. So do I want to make a wicker cover? Well, it's a little lame. How does the wicker grow? It sort of like has many tangles. Is there a glass that has many, many divisions? Hmm. Can we design a glass that is divided in the middle into different sections? So is there a glass that I could bring, or maybe it's, it's divided in two Maybe is there a glass that has one fluid, a slow fluid, a slow flowing fluid here and a fast rear? It'd be interesting. If I have orange juice here and I have sparkling water here, I can sort of like have two things going on at the same time. Maybe, I'm not sure, but it definitely yeah. goes already in a different direction than if I've never thought of the wicker. And Many of our projects, definitely the projects where the, the original concept came from me, came out of that sort of thinking. Yeah. And it has an extreme advantage that it's super fast. I Meaning you can do this in three minutes. It's a, yeah, I mean, it's a very free and, and um, uh, narrative approach, right? It's not, not the approach that gets you stuck in the, the restrictions that you always uh, encounter as a designer, but you probably work with the restrictions later. But uh, first to try to build a vision which is strong enough to make you bring the design idea through those restrictions. Yeah. Um, well, uh, De Bono has a brilliant uh, explanation of why it works. He basically says that uh, our brain is rather lazy and doesn't really want to spend a lot of energy actually thinking. So the first answer when we ask, what kind of glass should I design? It gives us is connections that it has made before, meaning like glasses that we have seen, or if, if I have designed the glass before, 
the first image that the brain gives me is the deepest connection, which is probably a glass I've designed before, before, which of course also would be an easy explanation of why so many designers repeat themselves or work in an extremely narrow field because they ultimately that's what the brain gives them back. Mm -hmm. Stefan, one last question, which I find very interesting um, from the audience. Uh, what are your thoughts about AI overpowering design? And it's linked to another question that I read, uh, which is more or less, um, how, what do we tell students today who are only thinking about you know, digital design, AI, and don't give a shit about composition and AI? I, I think both questions are connected. No. Well, I, uh, I'd say this, like when we, uh, when we worked on the beauty show, there's also, there's a VR element in the, in the show and the designers or the designer, the main designer of the VR stations actually wrote a thesis. I don't, I have to paraphrase. I don't remember the actual, the exact title, but it was basically how to invent a field that teaches the machine aesthetics. So he basically created sort of like a idea what field would, who, what other fields would enter into this that would make it possible for the computer to make decisions about beauty. Mm. And this looked very convincing to me. Meaning I don't think that it would that it might go initially, it probably wouldn't be very sophisticated, but simple aesthetic decisions mm -hmm. could definitely be made by a computer. Mm -hmm. And luckily, nobody has really answered his field yet. So, but I could see that in the next decades that this would become a serious contender for maybe not for the high end, but definitely all the way until the middle sort of decisions. So basically I could definitely see where you would, a world where you would dictate, I want a website that is 70% art deco, 20% pop, and give me 10% of that quirky underground 1976 punk feeling that we saw in Manchester. Uh, and that's sort of like the aesthetic direction that I want. And the machine builds me that website with a functionality that I dictate, yeah. which of course would make a significant amount of the design community to be out of jobs, if that actually happens. My experience from the past, because of course I am old enough to have lived through times when people thought that, you know, the advent of uh, InDesign or Illustrator or Photoshop already will bring us all, would all cost us our jobs because these jobs would now be done by secretarial professions that went to a quick course. Now that clearly so far has not happened, but I'm very aware, I'm very aware that if skill is not part of a profession anymore, things can get dangerous for the people within that profession. I mean, but you obviously what happened to typesetters or what we see happening right now. You know, I think the fact that everybody can take fairly decent pictures on their phone is complete, is for sure hurting the world of professional photographers. Yeah. Uh, in design, I think my own, my own feeling is that we are in a little bit of a spe special situation because the profession is so incredibly wide. And for those of us who are agile and, uh, and and willing to change enough, my guess is that there will always
by our way of thinking. So while I would not recommend anybody to go into art school to become a professional fashion photographer right now, I really think that is not a good idea. I would very, without any doubt, very happily uh, endorse somebody to become a communication designer right now. Mm. And of course it will change. I and mean, you would have to be, you would have to be able and willing to go with those changes. Yeah. Great, Stefan. Thanks so much. Uh, I think it was a very uh, inspiring also outlook towards the end of our talk into the future of the profession. Um, I had a little problem with the image um, in the last two minutes, so uh, I think it's a good moment to stop. <laughs> Excellent. Yep. Because that was so, um, so stable, and I think the talk was super interesting, Stefan. Um, it was, it was such a pleasure a with you, and we, we touched upon a lot of different topics. Thanks so much for that. Um, for the audience, the talk will be visible online on our Instagram account on the IGTV button and also in our story and on our, our YouTube channel. So you can uh, watch it again if you like. Uh, and next week uh, we'll have another talk on Thursday night at uh, 6 p.m. Central European time. So you're all welcome to tune in again. I'm not telling the guest yet, but we're announcing it uh, next Monday or Tuesday. So I'm really looking forward to having you all back again as the listeners. And Stefan, to you, I really want to thank again. It was a, a wonderful journey throughout your, your work, but also through your career, your inspirations, your amazing projects. And I wish you a very good rest of the day. And I Hope we'll be able to meet again in, in person soon. Perfect. It was a pleasure. Thanks so much, Matteo. Thanks for the Thank opportunity. You. I appreciate and it. Thanks again, Wonderful. our audience, and uh, see you next week. Bye bye. Thank, Thank you. you.